Hello everybody, it's me the Boss Hog. Today we're going to look at my buys and sells this week, uh, but we're also going to spend some time looking at Hollywood Bowl. It's top 10 holding for me and I'm going to explain to you why I think it's 21% undervalued. Let's do it. All right, so I guess it's still a bit of a roller coaster. I've used that word now for like four weeks, so maybe it's a bit overused, uh, but actually one of the best weeks I've had for some time. Um, it started pretty well, it was a little bit iffy in the middle, um, but then actually toward the end it was really good. Um, this Friday we got American Exuberance after having said last week that I didn't get any, uh, and now that means my portfolio is actually quite comfortably back above uh, six figures. Um, still nowhere near all time highs, um, you know, still uh, sort of about break even in terms of my overall portfolio, whereas I had been up 16,000, uh, but feeling pretty good uh, for sure. So uh, yeah, definitely a good finish to the week and broadly speaking, a, a good week compared to what we've had, uh, at least for me. Uh, no more capital added this week. I've been running a couple of weeks ahead of my schedule, still one week ahead of plan. Um, but, you know, I did think about adding a little bit on Friday. But again, just uh, I was a bit stubborn, to be honest with you. And I think it's going to be a quite a volatile couple of months still. So no rush to add capital, uh, especially considering I'm ahead of plan at the moment. Uh, very modest trading this week as well. To be honest, I think I've done a big majority of my trading. Um, you know, uh, over the last five weeks, I've swapped out about 30 percent of my portfolio. Uh, this was definitely uh, one of the quieter ones, uh, but you'll see in a second. I did I did trim a, a little bit and uh, bought in uh, the semi and uh, tech sphere more generally. And last but not least, uh, a very large dividend, my largest to date. It is just a special, to be clear, um, but still, um, this was expected. Um, I'm into Aviva for the turnaround. Basically, that it has more or less completed. They sold off some of their business and they've redistributed uh, that money back to shareholders. So um, basically, I've got one pound uh, and one P for each share I held, so 400. Um, and that was also part of a share consolidation as well. So uh, that was expected and it feels really good. And you'll see that I put it uh, where I put it in just a second. Let's have a look now. All right, so just a couple of things to talk about. Uh, so first of all, my Aviva dividend went straight into Google. Uh, I got this at 22.31, so not exactly ideal, but to be honest with you, I consider um, this a clear buy. Um, I get some of the risks around advertising. There's also some regulatory concern as well, talking about you know splitting up uh, some of their advertising tech uh, in the background. Uh, but I still think this is a, a beast of a company that has a extremely wide moat and um, I would argue probably has the best sort of cost benefit of any of the big techs at the moment. I think considering the share price and the long term certainty of the business, if there is such a thing, um, I think it's a really good uh, buy. Um, this is my class A, which is the side of my Google shares I'm not averaging into. I do also have class C in another portfolio where I'm just, you know, adding £100 a month. I'm going to be curious to see which one outperforms. Uh, class A here is when I do chunky acquisitions just based on, you know, whether I think it's a buy um, rather than DCAing uh, mindlessly. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, by the way, in terms of who I think the best tech is, I still think Microsoft wins that. Um, but, you know, they're hardly cheap uh, even in this market. So, um, you know, I think Google it is definitely that that cost benefit for me. Um, next up, we've got Micron. So I decided to add more. This is still a relatively new position for me. And to be honest with you, um, I'm buying Micron under 70. Uh, I think this 67 here is just really great value. I think it looks cheap PE wise. Um, I do have Amcor, you can see here, as one of my larger holdings, um, who I also think is still cheap. Um, but Micron, I wanted to add a little bit more to. I think Micron specifically is a bit of a play on the storage uh, element of things. Um, in the past, maybe their income has been a bit irregular, but you know, as they move into data centers and as storage becomes uh, a more important uh, component of solutions, uh, I sort of expect Micron to be a big winner. I expect their revenue to become a lot more regular. And I think they're well positioned in what's a bit of a niche effectively um, for that. So <clears throat> I think here this 67 represents really great value. And um, for me, I'm kind of trying to be a little bit stubborn at the moment. I've got my average down to 69. So I don't really want to buy any more of Micron unless it's under 70. Um, just, I guess I want to keep my average, uh, what I think is really good. So, uh, again, that's my rationale there. Uh, anyway, let's have a look at what I sold. All right. So I just trimmed what is still my most profitable holding. Uh, I'm up almost 5,000 on my realized and unrealized positions in, uh, Huntsman. Um, I sold 14 shares. So going from 114 to hundred, uh, I took a small 4% profit on that sale. 
Um, I mentioned when I got back into Huntsman, um, you know, under 34, uh, that I consider it a, a good company at a reasonable price. I, I don't think the sort of mid 30s is a amazing price for Huntsman. Um, I think it should be somewhere in the high 30s. So, you know, I sold out of these 14 shares at 35.15. So maybe leaving 10% on the table there. Um, but again, I, I think that Micron is more significantly undervalued. And um, to be honest with you, I just, I, I wanted to free up just a little bit of money to buy under 67. Now, that was like the point. I was like watching it. And I was like, right, if it goes under 67, I'm going to sell uh, a couple of Huntsman shares. So uh, that, that, that was that really. I still plan on keeping uh, probably these hundred of Huntsman. I still like it as a business. It's my only um, holding in the industrial segment at the moment as well. I'm a little bit kind of nostalgic and romantic when it comes to this company, uh, just because it served me so well. Um, but, you know, I think it's um, it's OK to take a little bit of money and redistribute it. So that was my uh, rationale there. But I still think it's a perfectly reasonable buy in the mid 30s. Uh, OK, so just that very simple this week uh, and now top 10, which is also very simple this week. So, yeah, you can see my week on week change here. Almost a clean sweep of greens. Uh, Gamma let me down a little bit. It did have a very good week last week, finally, for the first time in about a year. Um, but you can see that this was a, a positive week. Um, a lot of my companies had green weeks um and yeah it felt really good uh, what can i say um there's very little news though that i have i have to say um hollywood bowl did their six month trading update which i would say were on the better side of expectations uh, we're going to talk about them a little bit more in just a second and the only other thing really that i wanted to call out was that legal in general there's an article on the motley fool i'll put the link in the description normal stuff just highlighting the fact it's got a really great dividend FTSE 100 mainstay well covered in terms of its payout ratio um and arguing that it's one of the better dividend stocks because it's not it doesn't rely on any cyclicality like sort of your rio tintos or, or those kind of businesses um, I think those points are fair. The other thing that I would add, which also the article does touch on, is the fact that um, legal in general are very profitable, both with their underwriting business, as, uh, but in particularly their investment uh, side of their business as well, uh, which is uh, UK insurers in general are benefiting from sort of some of the regulatory movement and, you know, requests basically from the government for companies to invest in in various things that sort of serve insurance companies very well. So um, again, I, I've commented that this could arguably be your, you know, you could only pick one FTSE 100 company, which one would you pick to hold forever? Legal in general could be in that conversation. So not too much this week. Uh, and instead what I wanted to do is sort of move a little bit more on where I'd like to be taking these weekly updates. Cause I think, you know, moving forward, there will be less trading. Uh, and instead, you know, look at my portfolio, what it's been doing during the week, absolutely. But also spend a little bit of time looking at one of my companies or maybe a company I'm considering buying, maybe something someone's asked me to look at. So uh, without further ado, let's have a look at Bolt, their trading update and why I think they're undervalued at the moment. All right. So um, now Hollywood Bowl have obviously been very impacted by um, COVID, but they have recovered extremely well very resilient business um, because of how their financial year falls. Technically, they did manage to eke out like one million pound in profit for the last two years. Um, very fortunate in a way, but actually, again, demonstrating how good the business is when they're open. Um, so they reinstated their dividend. This was great. And just as they did before uh, COVID, they made a commitment that they plan to restore the 50 percent payout ratio. It's a fairly new company, by the way, in terms of its listing. So we can only go back to 2016. So really, they only had been doing that for sort of three years. Um, and a lot of their uh, updates um, compare 2019 to now, for, again, I think for obvious reasons, right? Uh, so the big call out for me was this EPS growth uh, across that time, really impressive. I think especially for companies that are growing, the EPS is really what matters, uh, at least for me personally. I want to make sure, again, for me personally, I'm investing in profitable businesses now. Don't want to be investing in, you know, speculative uh, stocks, really. Happy to take a small cap, has to be making money. That's basically my uh, viewpoint here. Um, they, I mean, again, during lockdowns, they put a lot of effort into managing costs. Um, they didn't really touch on it here, but they previously renegotiated a lot of their leases and things like that. Um, but also, you know, staff costing went up the better part of 6%, which was in line with expectations. Pleasingly for me to see, I like it when a small company is sensible and hedges what can be material parts of their costs. So they are fully hedged until 2024. Um, they believe currently that they're paying 30% less than they would do from um, market rates if they were buying in 2022. 
and they're also looking at extending their hedge to 2025 so that feels good and again they might um you know lead to opportunities elsewhere right if some of their competitors haven't done that then uh, they're going to be really struggling at the moment also to help with that they continue with their solar rollout so they're basically putting solar panels on all of their sites uh, that should reduce um costs moving forward by 30 percent um you know so again that that's another win uh, from that perspective uh, and likewise they are managing food inflation they called it modest they didn't actually give a number to it um <clears throat> but you know that they're, they're managing that as well so i, I felt pretty good about that <clears throat> uh strong balance sheet and cash reserves are over 50 million um it says 50 million here uh, in another place it says 55 uh but okay uh, also something to highlight as well with these kind of you know customer focused businesses like the brand and the engagement scores and the customer satisfaction scores like these are some of the best I've seen like well into the 90% um, even though they've got really tough comparables they're still moving in the right direction um, and also something else that I really want to highlight because you don't normally think of bowling as sort of being a, a tech business but I think Hollywood Bowl actually deserves a lot of credit for their digital offering and I, like I hate the word digitization it's like a real buzzword in my industry as well it's basically meaningless but this is sort of how I think it's meant to be done um so you know this is like they have an incredible um customer um, record management so they have two million uh contactable customers bearing in mind this is a UK business right so they basically got you know several percent of the UK population on their mailing list um you know that there's been a significant increase in the amount of online bookings so again I, I tested this myself the online booking journey is incredibly painless and um encourages you to sort of spend more you know would you like to book yourself in for this would you like some drinks on your arrival would you like this and that right and this is one of the reasons why they call their their lfl sales so this is basically their average spend per game um has been going up so you know you're basically in a situation where you're opening more sites anyway your customers are coming back and when they come back they're spending more and they're spending more sort of in every area of your business whether that's the bowling itself which is about half of their income or whether that's the food and drink or whether it's the uh, amusement arcades that they have as well so you know it's a, a nice split of of that basically um likewise as well everything's done by apps so in terms of their food and drink app spending you know they did some testing and that encourages customers to spend more as well and likewise their pins on strings technology which they continue to roll out basically means the games can be run through a lot quicker uh, so again it just kind of feeds into that uh, dynamic you know like if i'm a person or i'm a family and i've got an hour to spend I might be able to you know sneak in an extra game and suddenly Hollywood Bowl's made like an extra 20 quid out of me, right? So it's, it's that kind of like thinking that really I, I like about this business. Like their, their CapEx plan for the next half is very logical. There's more of the same basically in terms of more solar rollouts, more site refurbs, which adds to ARPU as well. Um, and it, it's, it's just a, a positive momentum basically. Uh, this was big news for me. I wasn't expecting this, but uh, Hollywood Bowl has gone international. So uh, this has been a UK business only. Uh, however, they have made their first overseas expansion in the Canadian market uh, for £8.4 million. Pounds. Um, obviously, this is in Canadian dollars, but this is what it translated to uh, immediately with possibly up to an additional £2.1 million based on performance targets. Um, the mid-range of that 2.1 works out at 9.2 in terms of that Canadian company's PE. Um, I think that's reasonable. Um, it's interesting that basically Hollywood Bowl, um, in my opinion, sort of did an extension of their conservative management style. So they are buying a business that only has five alleys. Uh, it does also have like a B2B uh, business to business supplier side of that business as well. So that'd be interesting to see if they can make good use of that. Uh, they're leaving in place the management team. They think it's a very good business. They basically just want to kind of give it some capital investment, um, you know, expand it, basically treble it in size across the next couple of years um as well as basically implement their technology into that business they said that they picked the canadian market because they see a lot of similarities with the uk highly fragmented uh, basically a great opportunity for them to um, land and expand uh, so i thought that was unexpected but it made a lot of sense and i think it's been generally well received um in terms of you know a, a logical first step uh, internationally also, though, uh, we shouldn't forget that they have putt stars as well. So they only have four centers so far. 
Uh, they consider this at the moment still like in the rollout phase, uh, what they call testing, learning and evolving. However, those um, four sites are profitable. They add about 1.2 million uh, in EBITDA. Um, not necessarily sure, by the way, EBITDA is the best measure for this business, but they use it. And by the way, when you try and make sense of this um, trading update, I'll put the link in the deck from the investor relations. There's about five different profit figures you can use. Uh, when we get to pricing this, I did actually decided to use an even more conservative measure than the ones that get used here. The main reason is because there are like all sorts of VAT adjustments, government adjustments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So really, I, I'm using the the uh, like operational net profit rather than any of these uh, figures. Um, so my my number is going to be closer to 20 million. But just in case you're wondering what all of these uh, numbers are about, um, that's why, again, there's a full table, which is, I think, about as clear as they could have made it, in fairness, in the trading update. And, uh, and the accountants among you can have some fun. Uh, but but yeah, there, there's a few things that you can, uh, you can consider here. Um, I, I would say, realistically, the revenue figure you should use is the 91 million that they've had here. But again, even that, they have several revenue figures. Uh, and then the profit figure should be the 20 million. Uh, that they have in one of their tables. So <laughs> just in case anyone's uh, wondering about that. Uh, the only caution really from my perspective is that their H2 is normally quieter anyway, um, but they think it's gonna be impacted um, more than usual. So the reason why it's quieter is because, you know, when it's winter or autumn, it's a bit colder, maybe you wanna go inside and, you know, bowling alley, if it's a bit warmer outside, you probably are less inclined to do it, right? I still think that the argument with bowling is that it, offers affordable family entertainment. I really like the branding, as I've said before, with Hollywood Bowl, they've got a kind of slightly fun retro feeling about them. Um, it's big and fun and silly, um, it works. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what they're expecting this summer is basically people will have more holidays than usual and basically you know, be just out of the country and spending money elsewhere. So uh, likewise as well, I, I'm, I've given H2 a reasonable slowdown. Uh, in my projections. I think it's fair that they've called it out um, and we'll just have to wait and see uh, where we go. So that's a trading update. I would say it was a solid trading update. Um, again, it's a bit gray just because of all the profit figures. Uh, this was fractionally ahead of analyst expectations um, by about 10% um, and yeah, positive and with a couple of surprises like the Canadian expansion and etc. So that was that. Uh, so yeah, so th this was a trading update uh, and now let's see what it means in terms of my pricing and what the market expects. All right, so uh, in terms of what it's worth and getting to know a little bit more about Bol, um, here's some information. I'm going to walk you through my thought process. Uh, this is very much a work in progress, but uh, hopefully it's at least defensible or makes sense or at least at the very least you can understand where I'm coming from. However, I absolutely welcome feedback. Uh, give me a couple of weeks to get this uh, sorted and you know everyone being happy as much as we can hope. Um, but anyway, let's have a little walk through this. So uh, share price of £2.40. I've got this from my brokerage. Um, okay, a uh, number of shares here from Simply Wall Street, so 171 million. Obvious, I think obviously, but just in case anyone's not sure, market cap then is just the number of shares times the price of each share, gives you your market capitalization of the company, how much it's worth. In this case here, we're looking at 412 million. So definitely on the small cap, but not tiny either. Um, now, the figure I've taken here, as I was explaining earlier, is the profit once we strip out those um, VAT uh, clawbacks from previous years uh, that you're allowed to do, um, as well as the government help <clears throat> for bowling uh, as one of the leisure um, sectors that was impacted so i think here this is defensible i've then done a modest feedback and uh, modest pullback in uh, h2 um so that's why the full profit for the year there of 37 million now if you take that uh, profit and um basically divide it by the market cap you get our current year pe of 11.1 uh, in my opinion again depending on exactly where uh, you're getting it from you might see slight differences here but this there was um you know similarity when I was looking around Tester's logic. Um, next up, talk about the dividend. It's an interesting stock because even though it's small and still growing, before the lockdown, they were consistently having a payout ratio of 50%, right? That's what I was highlighting in the trading update as well, that they plan to return to that basis, basically. They, um, you know, so I guess, you know, when you think about a dividend growth company, they are going to be extremely correlated. Basically, your dividend growth is going to be the same as 
Hollywood Bowl's earnings growth. Uh, because whatever they earn, you're going to get 50% of it paid out in dividends. That's their commitment that they plan to restore. So fine, I, I'm that's very clear to me. Uh, so they have uh, resumed uh, interim dividend at 3P. I think the full dividend um, for the full year could be 11P. And that's based on the assumption of our 37 million divided by the number of shares and then divided by two to get our 50 percent basically that's how that works and assuming that's true uh, there's a lot of assumptions in that i get then that would mean that we would end up with a you know a, a second dividend of about eight pence that's right so 3p plus 8p gives 11p and as this is a uk share you typically get paid twice a year uh, an interim and a full so and and you know the ratio of those can be a little bit different so uh, this would be more like 25 percent, 75 percent um but yeah so that, that's my assumption based on that and you know for the reasons that i've just explained um so yeah <clears throat> that would give us an assumed eps of 22p uh interestingly here my analyst eps is and these are still being updated at the moment these are a little bit tricky to get but the 20 to 23 p seems to be the kind of new consensus that's emerging on anyone who's uh, updated theirs again i thought that was very interesting because i put my number in before i saw that so that again made me feel pretty good about my rationale here uh which then gives me an assumed PE of 10.9 using this particular metric again i would expect this to be very closely related to the uh you know the p of the profit just because of the way that it uh falls down uh, whilst an analyst PE has 11.2. So realistically here, we're looking at current year PE of 11. Um, as it currently is, you know, the share price um, and the expected profit for the year. Obviously, if the share price changes or the profit comes in materially different, either negative or positive, it's going to impact on all of these um, standard stuff, basically. <clears throat> so next up then uh, i wanted to give like my target pe because ultimately here we're going to use that to sort of try and understand um where what multiple we need to give to it basically so when i looked at what the company was trading on pre-lockdown they were anywhere between 15 and 20 in terms of their pe now what i decided here was to actually take the bottom end of that i think 15 now for a slightly more mature business is okay uh, but then I knocked off 10% for kind of risk. Um, if there was another lockdown, Hollywood Bowl would definitely be impacted. And although I don't expect them to fold, um, you know, I would be concerned that, you know, you weren't going to be getting your investment back so quickly. Uh, it would take longer to realize and so on. And likewise here, I think there are still some modest execution risks in international expansion. I think there always is. Uh, saying that I think the way that they've done it is pretty modest and so I just basically took the 15 PE from the low end as well as being feeling fairly respectable uh, minus 10% um, and gave this a realistic multiple of what I think anyway of 13.5 uh, so if I take my PE and then multiply it on what I expect to be the uh, the earnings for the company um, and then divide it by the number of shares I get my share target of 292. That's that's basically the, the process here. Uh, obviously, then that would be an upside of 51p, um, which represents the 21% upside. So that's the that's the thinking basically of this approach. I think it's incredibly difficult at the moment to do DCF uh, forecasting. Um, you know, any kind of forecasting at the moment is more or less people picking numbers out of the air. Like if you have a look at Simply Wall Street, like and you know they do quite a strict um discounted cash flows they think this business is really overpriced because again like you just don't really have uh, enough guidance um i'm assuming um that you know now that they've returned here that we're going to be seeing sort of strong single digit growth something like that um that would definitely mirror what they had again pre-lockdown but it's such a small amount of time even then you know they listed in 2016 lockdown came 2019 so you've got just a few years of uh, trading history so it's very difficult at the moment um for that and i think you know you have to take that um element of risk basically if you are wanting to buy this for me though uh one of the reasons why i wanted to do this is because my current average is like 220 so i'm comfortably up and i've been trading this company quite successfully so you know again I, i've got a four figure win on hollywood bowl at the moment and it was a case of well do i really want to be averaging up at 240 and actually i kind of think i do um because to me there's enough upside here and enough protection against those risks that i feel pretty good about it to be honest with you so 
Um, yeah, for me, I think 240 is a reasonable buy. That probably is the most I'd want to buy at for that margin of safety and the fact that, you know, the market's still a bit iffy at the moment. Uh, Hollywood Bowl's held up quite well. Uh, and I do think there is some significant upside with this business, which is well run, well positioned. Um, and again, well, it's just got a good springboard basically to build from. Uh, in all, I did have a little look around as well in terms of what other market consensus was. So we've got uh, this here from investing.com. I like using it, especially for UK stocks. Um, so again, they have a 315 target here, um, ranging from 280 to 350. I think that's perfectly sensible depending on what multiples and earnings you use as well. And likewise, not too far away is Yahoo. Um, and they've got very similar, uh, although they're, they're um, lowest, uh, actually, yeah, no, they've got the same range. Uh, I guess they're probably similar um, investment banks, etc. Like I say, uh, Simply Wall Street, if you did look at it, is believes this is materially overpriced at the moment, even at 240. But again, I just don't really think that the kind of automatic uh, discounted cash flow is doing this business any justice. I think you do have to get under the hood a little bit and and go from there so uh, hopefully that was interesting for everyone that's my take on hollywood bowl that's my updates this week any questions comments feedback and everything else please drop me a comment i'll do my best to reply otherwise thank you very much for watching everyone i've been the boss hog and good luck for your investing bye for now